It is in our nature to gather, to collect. This practice of collecting is both a creative act and a destructive one. To collect is to create an idea of an object, a landscape, an event or a process, one that has not previously existed. Yet when we collect, we change an object's context forever and open up new interpretations. Can we respond to our future by collecting our present? When we collect, what exactly are we responding to? What are the crucial events that are happening right now? What are the moments we need to stop time for, to consider, to document? What are the moods, the emotions, the fears, the knowledge and the learning that we as a global society are responding to? Is collecting a way of making sense of the chaos around us? Do these stories help us to justify our existence? Can the stories we collect form evidence, a testimony, or a trigger for change? Can collecting give us the power and agency to elicit a global shift for a more responsive future? everyday people decided that they were going to play a role in shaping history and in shaping their own destiny. And so I want people to understand that each of us has that power. And so that's why whenever I think about collecting around social justice or collecting in general, the thing that stands out to me is humanity, voices and experiences. I collect to preserve those things. Uh, it's less about collecting an object to preserve the object as an object or artifact. It's really about collecting an object to preserve its humanity, its voice, and the experiences the artifact represents. I think, especially when it comes to large institutions like, like the one I work in, um, you have a responsibility about what you collect. And, and as I mentioned, you have to really think about whether it belongs here or whether we're making it as accessible as possible, which for me is the most important thing. So I guess the other word would be maybe accessibility, but I guess that word can, can very easily be misinterpreted, but I mean it in a way where it's like, how can we make things as accessible to the majority of people? Education, professionalism, and ethics. You have to check uh, the, the the veracity or or, or, or the, the the quality of the info that you are collecting. This is very important, and I think this is uh, also the very first uh, condition to be for to be a good historian or to be a good archaeologist or whatever is the field that you are working. You have to to be authentic. First word word would be freedom because it did give me freedom um, to collect things that I hadn't collected before. Democracy in terms of democratizing and opening our, our collections. Redefinition, um, thinking of um, what a museum collect, collection should have, um, how we are collecting and um, by whom are they created? I would say that our museum is really built on a foundation of social justice. Uh, we're looking at Black Lives Matter now as sort of a 21st century uh, movement, but I think our museum makes the argument that Black Lives Matter has been happening for 400 years. Uh, the history of African Americans in this country, again, going back for 400 years has always been about resistance and hope and fighting for equality and making sure that that America lives up to his promises, um, as promised to us by the Constitution and, and promised to us through the guarantees of the American democracy. 
and really our museum on every single floor, looking back as far back as 1400, really tells that story. How for 400 years, Black Lives Have Mattered. We're responding to the Black Lives Matter protests uh, that happened uh, this summer, over this uh, past summer, uh, looking more specifically at George Floyd's um, death in Minneapolis, uh, followed by a number of others, including Breonna Taylor. And so, uh, of course, we've been doing collecting around that and also looking at ways that we can collect around COVID. Um, those are probably the two more important uh, ways that we're uh, all involved in some way in collecting or finding ways of connecting to communities. I have to go back to 2019. I mean, it's not just because of COVID. In 2019, we started, in fact, uh, going economically bad. Uh, the situation uh, was going worse and worse. I mean, you're talking about unemployment, we have a crisis of liquidity of currency. So uh, the country was living very, very uh, bad moments. And uh, they were starting from October, we got what we call the Saura, which is a movement of protest against, uh, let's say, some taxes. And, uh, and uh, they started uh, going in the streets. Uh, so starting from October, uh, almost all institutions sometimes closed completely because uh, they were blocking the streets. So you see that our the story, let's say, of, of, of Lebanon starts in before COVID. And then starting from January, uh, COVID came. And the worst part of the life of Lebanon was on the 4th of August when we got the blast of uh, the port in Beirut. And uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it destroyed almost half of the city of Beirut with all the institutions, uh, schools, hospitals, uh, museums, uh, libraries, uh, houses. And, and for the museums, you see, uh, we had eight museums uh, destroyed, damaged during by the blast uh, in, a, in almost a circle of 10 kilometers far from the, 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 the point of the blast, imagine. Now you have to rebuild your museums. So from collecting, experiencing um, Ramadan um, during the pandemic to uh, Black Lives Matter and um, the disproportionate effect of COVID on BAME communities or the experience of uh, Jewish Orthodox communities in London, so we did, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done, um, don't get me wrong, but I think it was like a step closer to engaging and um, opening up um, our collection. What we found challenging, I would say, is that doing a rapid response collecting projects while the event is you know, happening at the same time, what we found really interesting is we knew which stories we wanted to tell, but we found re really hard to find an object to represent that. Like there were, you know, there were themes that we wanted to include and difficult things like domestic violence or death or depression or isolation or loneliness that um, were all you know part of um, the COVID experience especially during the lockdowns but it was very hard for a museum to find the object to tell these stories and find an object that you know would make sense in 50 100 years time to be able to unveil these narratives of these difficult experiences in london it is one of the most important issues of our time we need to sort of like repair our bonds with nature um not only because we sort of like have levied a disproportionate amount of power, but also because our survival depends on it. Large institutions like MoMA contribute to climate change in, in many different ways, you know, from their buildings and sort of like the, um, the size and kind of like operation and embodied costs of their buildings to the, the sort of like embodied costs and kind of like um, impact that putting on large exhibition ha exhibitions has. Um, 
So I think it would be, again, irresponsible for us not to actually think about it in a way that like, again, sort of like help, might help uh, us create a sort of like a, a new attitude towards it um, through our kind of like programming, but also internally for us to kind of like understand that we, we also contribute to it and we need to kind of like change the way we, we behave. We know that it is the more, most vulnerable populations, the ones that are being affected the most. Climate change and the way in which sort of like um, access to renewable energy is hardest for the com for communities of color and the most sort of like vulnerable communities, but also because it really speaks to sort of like the capitalist systems that contribute to climate change and sort of like the way in which capitalism can act as a sort of like, um, as a sort of like, you know, barrier. Well, I think uh, as a historian, you you have um, you have an interest in understanding not just history but human progress, understanding more about humanity. And for me, when I look at objects and I'm thinking about objects to bring into the collection, I'm specifically looking at ways of documenting um, some sort of narrative around humanity and uh, human progress. And uh, so. That's probably one of the more interesting parts of the job. It's not just about going out and finding objects to just bring back to a storage facility. It's really about looking at moments in history and asking yourself, what are some of the voices that we want to preserve uh, that represent this moment? And how can we represent those voices through objects? How can we tell stories? Um, how can we reflect some sort of humanity through this object as part of this story. And so in building the collection, you think about multiple stories that are part of a longer arc in history. And you look for the gaps, you know, what are the voices that aren't being heard that have not been represented or have been misrepresented? And how can I as a curator and a historian remedy that? It's part of your job. So you don't ask yourself questions, should I do it or, or can, can I do it? I mean, this is why I was saying uh, we are full of, of this kind of energy in Lebanon to collect and, and to, to keep back or to keep safe, this even the information, just to pass it to the, to the next generation. You know, we have to be also kind of balanced between what is the tragedy and what is, there's always a good aspect or part in, in something you have to find it and that moment the collect, collecting the info should be at that moment a, a whole package it's not just the tragedy it's all what went together with this tragedy bringing together the people and and this is what we we, we have to collect and what we have to to present or to tell the people humans just physiologically don't um very we don't really easily can have a, a sense of the long time. We can only see past a few generations, um, but it is really our responsibility, you know, to the climate, to sort of like other species and also to ourselves to think beyond that, to understand that what we do today um, has an impact in sort of like years and years to come. Um, another important theme that we sort of like really wanted to kind of highlight was the, was the idea of repair. As I mentioned, um, restorative design really sort of like um, it's a really broad topic and, and, you know, the idea of reparations can be applied to a lot of things. You know, I'm, for example, from, from a Latin American country, I think about reparations when it comes to the armed conflict. Of course, in the U.S., we're thinking about reparations a lot when it comes to sort of like um, Black communities and sort of like a systematic history of racism in this country. Um, but it can, it can also apply to this idea that we need to sort of like repair our bonds with nature, um, not only because we sort of like have levied a disproportionate amount of power, but also because our survival depends on it. Everyday acts that even though obviously individual choices um, are not what, what's going to save us from climate change, um, design as a sort of like as, as a discipline that changes behavior can sort of like um, help us sort of like 
change the way in which we think in which we act on a daily basis and a sort of like large amount of sort of like restorative actions eventually will lead to sort of like to long lasting change. So very soon after the first lockdown in London um, in March 2020, um, we started realizing that this is, you know, a moment in history. This is a moment um, in London and in the lives of Londoners that we should document um, and we should be able to tell the story of this um, pandemic uh, for future generations. From the very beginning, um, I saw collecting COVID um, as a way not only to create um, a collection around COVID, um, for the museum, but also a way where we could um, uh, stretch and um, open up our collections to make them more um, uh, approachable and more uh, relatable. So I wanted to see if we could add more uh, emotion and feelings and real um, experiences of people in our collections. So as a museum of social history, people, uh, Londoners are in the heart of our collections and we tell the story of the city through people's um, eyes and perspectives and experiences. The Museum of London, as we know it now, opened its doors in 1976 and it was the amalgamation of the London Museum, which was based in Kensington Palace and um, Guildhall um, Museum. So both collections merged and they created the Museum of London. What is fascinating is that the first rapid response contemporary collecting project happened over a hundred years ago in 1917. So during World War One, Museum of London collected uniforms, uh, women's uniforms that they were undertaking, what traditionally were like male professions, because, you know, the men, you know, went uh, to the war to fight in the trenches. So the women that left back, they became, you know, um, bus conductors, for example. It's one of these very, strong moment that I, I, I lived, you know, in, in, the, in the 90s. At that moment, I was appointed so the, as being the curator of the National Museum. And, and you know, that uh, the events of Lebanon, how we call it here, were over and, uh, and the museum was almost completely demolished. Uh, not because it was a target of the battle, but because uh, what we call in, in, in this uh, world of, of damage is the collateral damage. It was on the, uh, the, the demarcation line and so it was it has to witness all the, the violence uh, all through the years. So the walls were, were the building by itself has to be repaired so we had to start from scratch and this was the specific experience it was like building a new museum so we kept it as it was uh, and identique and then we started restoring it we kept some traces of the the violence not maybe too much some people will say uh, why didn't you leave more than this? But I mean, it was about reconstructing. It was about remodeling the image of Lebanon. And we wanted to give the best of this museum. The National Museum was also gone very far in, in the violence, left the, the, the world of museums. I completely agree. Uh, we did that in, in, uh, in the National Museum. We have a small uh, showcases with uh, burned objects. Uh, and we kept some pieces which were broken. You know, I keep saying that museum is a, is a story. Uh, you have to tell a story to the people to, to attract them and to, to, to let them understand what you are presenting or exhibiting. Plus, this is part of your history. I mean, it's the history of the country and it's the history of the museum. So you cannot wash it away and you should not when we collect things with at MoMA, we really think about how the work that we are collecting fits within our, our existing collection um, in terms, for example, of themes. So as I mentioned, new materials being an important one in terms of sort of like geographies that we want to focus on in terms of sort of like the relevance of 
of the work at the specific time. We made a series of, um, of acquisitions um, related to broken nature. Um, a lot of them focused on new materials um, because for, you know, for many reasons, I think a lot of the reasons were just logistics. Those were the works that we were able to collect at the time, but also they, as I mentioned, they very much fit with with what MoMA has sort of like focused on in the in the past. And so, for example, one of the works that we immediately collected was a work called Okinaganode, which is this sort of like giant, giant structure made out of seaweed by a designer called Yulia Loman. We call it the big monster. It's a huge structure that really acts as a kind of like experiment in the use of seaweed as a building material. And so that, for example, was one of the sort of like pillars of our exhibition, not only because it's like it's it's a resting and it's it's huge. So it really sort of like made it quite a presence in the show, but also because it really sort of like speaks to an interesting use of of a material that is not really, you know, well known. Because of climate change, seaweed has become incredibly prevalent in some of the bodies of water. Uh, and in some cases, the presence of seaweed is not actually good for the ecosystems that live there. And so, you know, using that sort of like excess of seaweed in itself is like a sort of like a very reparative approach to building. We decided to go down to Lafayette Square just to look at the space and to get a sense of the space and ways that uh, the story there could be told, but also thinking about objects um, that might be there and how to preserve them. Even if we didn't do, uh, do the preserving ourselves or the collecting ourselves, uh, we were concerned about making sure that there were, that the objects there could somehow be preserved, be saved, um, and uh, the story itself could be preserved and thinking again strategically as curators and historians um, how might we represent represent the story not just today but how could curators represent the story 100 200 years from now of course uh, lafayette square is uh, the park right in front of the white house and it's the space where the former president of course um, walked to saint john's church um, for the photo op with the Bible. So that photograph and that event is um, now in a, a part of history, uh, particularly because it also marks uh, a, a key moment in protest from the summer in which there was major conflict between um, uh, law enforcement um, and authorities and demonstrators we recognize that that was an important moment, a, a key shift in protest over the summer, uh, for me at least, uh, one in which is anthropological as well as uh, historiographical, where I'm both an anthropologist interested in culture and finding ways to preserve cultures. And then of course, history. Um, how do we create historical narratives? I think it's really important that if you're thinking about ways of telling the story either today or 100 years from now, that it helps to be a part of the history in some way or to have experienced and seen part of the event for yourself. It's not necessary, of course, because um, like many historians, you know, we can, we can do research on anything um, at any time, as long as there's evidence and some sort of, you know, documents have been preserved, records have been preserved. But I think it's very different uh, when you've actually been in the space and you've met with folks who were part of the experience and you've talked to them about their experience. It can change your perspective on even how you see the event. And at, you know, a conversation can really change the way you think about how to collect around an event. What I found like really um, sweet is um, for some reason, and I don't know if this reason is that um, we all dream. Dreaming doesn't, you know, um, have like, you know, um, silos or it's not only, you know, um, it doesn't have like, you know, um, a class background or, you know, a sex background or, you know, like an ethnic background, like everyone is dreaming. And this collection is very powerful because it's full of emotions and feelings. So 
being inspired by these uh, testimonies that we have in the collection, I wanted to collect dreams in this, you know, powerful way of people na narrating or sharing or communicating their own dream, because I do believe there is a lot of power in the actual act of sharing your dream. Sometimes, you know, your dream doesn't even exist or it comes to life the moment you share it with someone like the first thing that we want to do when we wake up and we remember our dream is that we want to tell someone about it and the fact that suddenly during the pandemic people remembered their dreams more or they started remembering a lot of details and a lot of people experienced dreaming in colors which is um, quite rare adding you know more feeling and emotion and stretching, as you said, the definition of a object, like can a dream, uh, this intangible sharing of feelings can be part of a collection. And I, I wanted to provoke this. So one of these things that, you know, we usually take for granted outside the pandemic, like sleep um, was affected very much. So on the one hand, people's sleep was um, affected um, because probably this um, pandemic, the novelty of it or the um, obscurity of it um, affected us um, subconsciously more than consciously. So that was uh, manifested through um, a shift in our sleep patterns. But also our lives, especially during the lockdowns, um, became more boring. So probably our brain was trying to find the stimuli that were missing from our day-to-day um, -day life uh, in our sleep. Um, so I started realizing that, first of all, I experienced it personally, but then, you know, through conversations with like colleagues and friends, and then, you know, reading um, articles and reports, um, I realized that was a common thread that a lot of people were experiencing. So that's how Guardians of Sleep came about. And that's why I wanted to collect dreams, not as um, a depiction or an artistic um, response or to a dream, but I wanted to collect dreams as a first hand experience, like an oral testimony of the actual person who had um, the dream. So Broken Nature um, was originally conceived as um, the 22nd Triennale di Milano in 2019, and it was organized by as a, my colleague Paola Antonelli. And the exhibition, as it was conceived, looks at what we call restorative design, which is a sort of like ongoing, it's like a concept of design that is you know, constantly being defined. There's really not like one definition for what restorative design means. Neri Oxman really is at the center of this. And, you know, one of my favorite, it has been one of my favorite projects to work on. Um, and sort of like the center of the, the kind of like centerpiece of this exhibition was um, a, a large commission called the Silk Pavilion II, um, which actually is also a sort of like a continuation of existing research into what it means to collab, to sort of like collaborate um, with other species and other mechanisms to create sort of like more sustainable ways of thinking um, and of building. And so the Silk Pavilion um, research started with the idea of how can we sort of like rethink the way in which we harvest silk. Um, a lot of us actually don't know that uh, the way in which silk is harvested is that the, once the silkworm has built a cocoon, it is, it is boiled so that it can be sort of like threaded as one single thread. And this of course kills the animal. And Neri and her team at the Mediated Matter Group realized that through like really, really sort of like judicious experiments that by manipulating the conditions and the temperature in which the silkworms weave, um, or spin their their silk 
particularly if you place them at a specific height, you can actually get them to spin flat as opposed in flat patches as opposed to in a cocoon. And that not only sort of like opens a lot of doors when it comes to sort of like architecture and really building, but it also allows for a, a really different approach within the silk industry um, that, you know, could allow us to not continue to kill these animals. And so with that idea, we commissioned her and her team to create a large structure that used co-fabrication. And so basically when we say co-fabrication co is of course a collaboration between humans and these animals, these really amazing animals, uh, but also with robots because you know it's really a sort of like three way uh, process of building. Uh, and so they, they made this really amazing structure um, that was made using kinetic manufacturing we're not really proposing a building, right? We're really proposing a process. And that process eventually will be available to all architects and designers. Um, and not only that, but it will allow to build different types of buildings that perhaps don't need to live forever, that perhaps, you know, can go back to the earth once they, they've served their purpose. And I think now that's one of the most powerful things that you can do. Another, for example, beautiful, um, beautiful work that we acquired um, is called Think Evolution Number One, Kiku Ichi, by a Japanese designer and architect called, sorry, designer and artist called Aki Inomata. Um, and in it, she basically explores the idea of sort of like um, inherited evolutionary knowledge by studying ammonites, which are kind of like these distant cousins of the octopus. And so she kind of like, you know, taking into account that, you know, in its in the course of its evolution, the octopus sort of like lost that shell that ammonites used to have, um, you know, in favor of kind of velocity and ex escaping from predators. Um, Aki Nomata actually, you know, took an ammonite shell and 3D printed a copy of it. And then she submerged it in a tank with her octopus named Mercy. And she sort of like explored that sort of like relationship between the object and the animal and how the animal instantly recognized it, even though octopuses haven't really had you know, shells for the longest time. She immediately knew what to do with it. She immediately took it like home. And so I kind of use these two examples to help you understand that, you know, one of them was sort of like the pillar work when it came to exploring new materials. And the other one instead was a sort of like pillar work to um, exploring the idea of empathy with other species. You know, it took 20 years to destroy the National Museum and it took 20 seconds to, to, to destroy uh, after the blast, this explosion of Beirut or the worst moment of uh, the city of Beirut. And, uh, but I mean, collecting is also part of your, what, I mean, it depends on the field that you are. If you are talking about maybe a history uh, museum or, or modern history museum who had, they should uh, for sure, I mean, keep uh, uh, traces of what happened. and. It, Definitely, this is part of the, the history of the country as for, of your, your history. So you have to, to show it in a way in your museum. But I mean, sometimes maybe it's not easy and sometimes it's easier for you. In December, there was an exhibition held in a museum and called the Wounded uh, Art. In fact, what uh, was done in this exhibition is to collect some shredded paintings some of the pieces were done on purpose to remember the, the moment that happened uh, at the blast and some uh, pieces were restored and put in the exhibition to show the people the traces of the, the blast. So you see that uh, it, there's a duty of memory for sure. Uh, it was, this is what we, done, we did in the Beirut National Museum and this what will be done for sure by the museums to tell or to the story, to tell the story of what happened one day in 2020. So you have to, to, to show it. I know that the American University ha, has, uh, has documented the restoration of the, the broken glass. They had, they, they had a showcase completely destroyed by the blast. It fell on the ground. And so they have tried to, to restore some pieces of the, the showcase, but they kept all the rest and uh, documented. And I hope that they will integrate it in the, in the exhibition. And they, so they, they collected, you know, the, the broken glass. And this, was, this is a story by itself. 
why the glass was was broken and uh, how it was restored who helped them doing this somebody or, or an organization should collect all this to bring them together they will start to be at that moment a collection and maybe we can we will open a museum for this just to tell the story the history of what happened but of course we really wanted to sort of like argue that it's not just that right that we're that we're really what we're showing here is a process and i think one of the ways in which people you know the one of the first questions that everybody asks is what is this for <laughs> like what can you do with this um but i think for us it was kind of empowering to say like well what would if, you know if, if an art of for example a student of design was asking me that i would say well what would you do with the process like it's something that you can you could actually <clears throat> sort of use for yourself in the future um and i think it really kind of like allowed us or it 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 did in some cases sort of like change the way in which people approach just exhibitions in general because these were not we were saying you know these are not necessarily finished objects these are demos really you know really beautiful ones but they're demos and we like that we sort of like liked um challenging the way in which people sort of like come to an exhibition one of the other things that you know we're, we're trying to do in general with collecting is like you know what does it mean to collect right now? In this case, you wouldn't necessarily be collecting an object, not only because it's huge and, you know, installing it is incredibly difficult. You could, you know, not install it very often, but really because what you are highlighting here is not necessarily the object. Again, it's the process. And so what does it mean to collect a process? Um, in many cases, you know, we've, we've thought about this within MoMA and you have the sort of like, the up, you have the object as a placeholder for that process, but um, how might it, that look like in the future? I look for the things that everyone can relate to, and then you tell the story of how that thing got here. So helping people to understand that um, is important to me. And in fact, I just had a conversation with a photographer, James Blair. Uh, we have been talking for some, for some time. He was a photographer with the National Geographic. And, and in two of those photographs, it's, you know, a similar sign. Um, it's in blue and it says, we demand an end to police brutality now. And to get people living and working today and thinking about George Floyd to see the connection to our protest, our work today is connected to the kind of work that was being done in 1963. I think people should understand that. So again, being able to show that con historical connection visually through artifacts like protest signs that speak to present day that might be from 60, 70, 100 years ago. So for going viral, um, and again, um, part of our digital collections um, are um, social media, uh, social well, it is a social media. Uh, there is a social media collecting strand, which um, I've always wanted to expand and build on. And when the pandemic happened, it was a very good opportunity, not only because of the way we communicate and how much we communicate more on social media and how much the communication has been boosted because of the fact of um, stay at home and um, the government's guidelines, but also because um, Londoners are, you know, usually are very good at responding to crisis with their humor. So um, we wanted to capture these, you know, memes and uh, that went viral, um, especially during the first lockdown when it was still very fresh. There was a lot of novelty around, you know, the, the way our uh, lives were turning into. So we um, started uh, identifying um, tweets that were posted by Londoners um, or were about London um, reflecting, you know, uh, experiences um, of people uh, during the pandemic. But the idea usually behind commissions when we think about contemporary design is because it allows us um, to highlight works that are that are thinking to the future. We commissioned um, 
a, an architect called David Benjamin, who is at Columbia University and who has really sort of like led the way in the study of embodied energy and really what it means for architecture. Um, and so we commissioned him and his team to make a video that really explored the embodied energy of MoMA's new building. So in which ways sort of like it's detrimental, in which ways it's actually, you know, embodied energy forward because of the amount of people that visit the museum and really how can we start thinking about embodied energy in our everyday life and as sort of like in, a, in our practice as curators and architects and designers. I'm really fascinating with that topic because that really is the beauty of architecture and design that like we are actually literally living in it and we need to sort of like start questioning um, what we surround ourselves with. When I go out uh, again, it's about representing, trying to represent um, some sort of humanity behind the story. Uh, I think it's really important that we see history as not something that's separate from ourselves, that it's something that, that happened to someone else who wasn't real, who's you know mythical. Uh, so of course, in America, uh, particularly African-American history, there are certain moments in the history of photography that are really key when you think about social documentary photography. And so it's during the civil rights movement when we're looking at these photographs and there are many famous photographs um, that everyone around the world can sort of recognize even if they don't know who the person is, they might recognize as say um, Rosa Parks sitting on a bus or the King photo when he was assassinated at the Lorraine Motel or you know King and the I Have a Dream speech. Even if you don't necessarily know the name of the person, you recognize um, the photograph in some way. And so I look at a lot of photographs and you could imagine when you're looking at these images, many of these people, you don't know who they are. They don't have names, they have faces. And you look at these faces and they're telling you something. You know, you look through these images and these images of these people, whether it's in moments of confrontation or moments when people are coming together as a community um, to talk about peace and love and kindness, what you see in their faces, what you see in their eyes and in their body language tells you so much about that moment. And it tells you a lot about who this person was. And so even though when you have a photograph and, and it might seem like there are hundreds of people in this photograph or 20 or 30, and you don't know who these people are, you don't know their names. You have to bring a certain humanity, you owe them the respect of trying to understand their humanity and positioning their humanity, their experience, which, very, which might've been very personal for them, um, presenting it in a way that's incredibly respectful. Um, and, and so I think that's, that might what drives me in so many ways to really want to explore the humanity uh, of history, that these were real people. When you look at the photographs of the marches, civil rights marches in Birmingham, and you see these teenage kids being hit with fire hoses, you know, we can sort of separate ourselves from that experience because, well, they didn't happen to us, but also this is just an object. We don't think of them as real people. Well, I'm interested in finding ways of exploring the humanity behind the photograph, whether with the photographer or the subjects of the photograph and helping people to understand that these were real people and this real experience happened in their very everyday life. That's important because I want people to understand that these aren't gods and generals. These are just everyday people, just like you, just like me. And these everyday people decided that they were gonna play a role in shaping history and in shaping their own destiny. Again, the, the trick is for folks to understand that they are, are a part of history, that the moment they're living in now or whenever, it's not isolated from moments that happened to people 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, you know, 200 years ago. And uh, I think that's an important lesson. When you go to places where you're looking at history that's hundreds of years from your own everyday life, you, you do tend to objectify the thing. 
you know, the object, even the fact that we call it an object, uh, we do tend to objectify this object and we are very far removed. One of the things that we're really good at doing with our storytelling is showing the trajectory from an earlier time to present day. The aim of, you know, uh, Gardens of Sleep, but of the wider, you know, collecting COVID project is to create a collection for future generations. So it will be used as um, every other object in the collection. What I'm uh, hoping is that um, analysts and, you know, psychoanalysts and researchers um, will be able to access this collection and draw their own conclusions and respond to it. Um, I'm also very um, hopeful that artists might be interested in this collection as well. So by accessing it, they might be able to respond creatively um, in this collection. And definitely, if and when we have um, a COVID exhibition in the future, I think it will be um, in the heart um, of this display. And I feel like our collection priorities are constantly shifting. I think you, the importance of what a collection is really changes with the times. Um, I think right now, a lot of museums are sort of like, questioning like what museums might look like after the pandemic, but also sort of like in a digital age. Uh, but for MoMA, the collection is really a way not only to sort of like kind of like create an archive of, of you know, what good design is right could be right now and was conceived of in the past, but also as a way to sort of like make these things accessible to the public. MoMA, for example, makes its collection fully online. Um, it can be accessible with images. Um, and so it's sort of like a way to create an archive that's, that's just, you know, sort of like for the public. Um, we are constantly sort of like reimagining and sort of questioning what it means to have a collection and really just what it means to be an institution of this nature. The world becomes more digital. Um, we also think about like what it's like to sort of like hold things or like own things physically when things can live online. Um, these are questions that we ask ourselves. It doesn't mean that we sort of like think that or all of a sudden we will stop collecting physically, but of course there it, it, it's things that we sort of like need to take into account of we sort of, as we move forward. Um, and of course, you know, museums after the pandemic have sort of like hit as well financially. So that has sort of like had implications in what we are able to collect. Especially during a pandemic, especially and probably during um, a lockdown, it did make me think of um, what is the role of museums in this pandemic. Um, when the lockdown, the first lockdown happened, um, museums started bombarding our audiences with so much digital content and events and more activity that I don't know if this is what people needed. And probably what people needed was just someone to listen to their dream. Maybe people don't want um, to watch more videos or, or do quizzes or you know, tests online. Maybe people need something different, as we said, you know, with the dreams. Maybe people just need, you know, a shoulder to basically, you know, uh, share a dream with. But I feel that we were probably were not, I don't know, confident enough or, you know, um, we were insecure to suddenly pause our activities and listen to the people, listen to our audiences, listen to the society, listen to the city. Um, I think that we still have the habit of thinking like we did like a year ago and in this year we were trying to overcompensate the activity that we didn't have in you know real life or in you know the physical space but um i feel that probably a more profound change needs to happen and this is a very good opportunity to reassess our aims and visions and goals and just open up and listen.
I think one of my favorite approaches to, if I had to say what kind of historian I am, is this concept of micro history. And I love this concept of micro history where essentially you can tell the story of the entire world through a single grain of sand. You know, that's incredible to think about that you can look at this really small, minute thing, but there's enough information in the small, minute event that can tell us so much about the history of the world. How did we get here to this one event?